Hey everyone, I'm your host, Robbie Straczynski, and thanks so much for joining us on episode number 65 of Cards Chat, the friendliest poker podcast in town. Today's guest <laughs> is Bill Perkins, an American hedge fund manager, film producer, and high stakes poker player from Houston, Texas. Last year, he published Die With Zero, a book about making your money work for you. Many of us know Bill from seeing him on televised and streamed poker broadcasts, and, of course, from his high-profile social media presence. But today, we get to dive a little bit deeper with the man himself and get to know him a little better. Bill, welcome to the Cards Chat Podcast. Thank you. Glad to be here. Good. I'm, glad to be... I'm doing all right. Um, I've been running around like crazy. You know, we're, we're in the holiday season, and, and it's a lot of meetings, parties, work family, et cetera, but I love it. That's good. That's good. It's good to be uh, involved in things that uh, you're happy to be involved when you, you know, choosing to, to spend your time uh, the way you'd like to. So that's a, a real blessing. Yes. Very cool. All right. So um, let's just dive straight in. Um, you know, we know you on the poker scene. You're kind of a staple for the last many years, but how exactly, you know, did you discover the game? And when was that in your life that poker first became a thing for you? Wow. Uh, I think um, it was when I was a clerk, screen clerk on the New York Mercantile Exchange floor. All the big traders played poker. They would have a weekly game. I didn't know how to play, but I just wanted to play. I just wanted to gamble uh, and, and play the game. Um, and I think that's how I got exposed to it. And I think I have a natural love risk type of personality you know <laughs> some of us have that and so it wasn't ever serious it was more recreational I, I you know when I first got involved it was a way to hang out with the big traders right and and and, and network and just be part of something and so I think as uh time went on and I, I became more financially successful and bigger I got more and more involved in poker but I was a losing poker player, you know, so I was uh, vaporizing um, whatever the stakes were, right, in terms of big blinds, right, and then started taking it more seriously about two years ago, three years ago, because the hobby was, you know, it was like, you know, this could be a net neutral hobby, it doesn't have to be a net vaporized money hobby, right, <laughs> of course. Of course. and so, and so that's kind of been my journey with, with poker, uh, okay. cool. in a nutshell. So so, so when you started, I'm kind of getting the vibe was it's a way to network, have fun, have a good time. Now, though, you know, obviously, like you said, you know, net neutral, you don't necessarily want to lose. What sort of experience or, or perhaps feeling or emotion are you chasing when you sit down at the poker table? I, I think now um, I, I find it relaxing. Hmm. Uh, there, there, there's just a group you focus most of the time, it's, you know, we get rid of our phones, you know, and, and not, not necessarily all the time in the home games. There's interesting conversations. You're testing your um, what you've learned, you know, your, your, your discipline, things you've learned. Are you going to break your own rules? Are you going to, you know, follow your money management? Are you going to make the play that you know you're going to play and not just be attached to the money in the pot? Are you going to be indifferent? You know, I, I think it's kind of like a for me, a leisurely test and social gathering in live settings. I like it. Okay. So when you finish a session, you feel good because? Wow. I, I feel good because, I mean, I, I can't get around the fact that I've spent time with people that either I'm just getting to know and I met some sort of interesting person who's doing something that I wouldn't even think is like even a career, right? And, and their story. And we've had debates and discussions over, I don't know, sometimes these things go 12 hours, 24 hours back in the day. Um, right. So in close contact. So, and then I feel good if I've just generally you know, scored myself a B or better in terms of the things I should be doing, right? Okay. With my game, right? Where, where, let's say my best game, given all the knowledge that I've absorbed so far, how, how well did I, you know, execute against that? Right. Right. I like it. That's so you do analyze your so it's like that, those kind of things. It's like, how did you do in a game playing or whatever? And then how was the game, the environment, you know, mm -hmm. I, you know, you, there's a lot of ways to make money, right? Um, and, you know, I tell people there's a millionaire in almost every single field, whether it's a shoe laster or a pizza person or, 
person in the garbage business or whatever, right? And so you generally have to, you know, I think one of the things you should do is find something that you at least enjoy a little bit, right? Like that you like doing. And so um, even if the game was extremely profitable, but it was like pulling my eyelashes out, being around the people, I, I would I would feel pretty bad. I feel like I wasted an hour of my, you know, hours of my life, right? And um, vice versa, if it was really great and I made these great connections or whatever and I had a losing session or whatever, I'd be like, whatever, I would have paid for this experience. So it's a combination of those two, the product of those two that gives me that feeling of like, that was a great time. I like you it. Know? I like it. Very good. Well, you said that you don't want it to necessarily, it could be like a, a net neutral pursuit. Um, what exactly do you do to improve your game beyond, you know, going over each session? Do you get in the lab like the pros or, you know, your schedule maybe makes it a little impossible. You got a lot of commitments. I mean, I've been working with uh, the Matts, uh, uh, MJ and and Matt okay. Boyd, um, and they, you know, they put out they're going to put out the uh, hybrid poker training app. I have the beta, although I still don't have the time to go to college. <laughs> like I just, I just, I can't go to poker college, right? So I'm a, I'm, you know. I use it. I'm learning. I talk with them about the spots. Obviously, some of the stuff that uh, I was training with my heads up match with Landon uh, transfers, you know, themes, right. concepts. Um, but, you know, there's limited ability for me to use this excellent resource. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that's because of my other values, priorities and how I allocate my time. It's just really at the end of the day you got to do the work, you know, yeah, now they do a great, it, it, and they do a great job of easifying it and speeding up learning, et cetera. But I run a pretty, pretty full life. So, so that, the, you know, I, I go into it. I, I do, you know, some work before and work after, but I am not anywhere near putting any kind of effort as a pro would put in. Sure. I understand. And I'm sure, you know, you've been playing for so many years, you must be aware of the image that you have when you sit down at the table with, you know, with the sharks, you know, who, who come right. on in, who do, you know, study and went to poker college and, and got the yeah. <laughs> PhD in GTO. Um, right. <laughs> does, does that sort of image as, you know, the high stakes, you know, the, the, the businessman, the wealthy business, does, right. does that bother you having that image or do you sort of like try to embrace it and make the most of it, you know, in, in, in given situations? No, I, I embrace it. I, I don't really, you know, true or not. I, you know, I, I grew up with a healthy dose of, I don't give a fuck if I can say, if I can yeah, say yeah. that, yeah. Um, you know, I don't, I don't want to turn this into a political show, but when you, you know, I'm, I was born in 69, my parents were born in forties. Uh, and if you know the history of this country, you know, they're, they're at, when I was growing up, uh, there were a lot of stereotypes and talks and this is what you people do and this type of thing and so I think it's baked in your culture to have a natural I don't care what you think right because you're used to all these negative things that are not true or you know people talking about you or down upon you because of you know race creed color skin national origin and I think other I'm not saying that um, black people have that other people have had that and so one of the benefits of that is you get a healthy dose of I don't give a fuck <laughs> you know what I mean and so um, I have that. And, you know, aside from like, you know, oh, you're terrible at poker. Right? I'm like, actually, they're kind of right. <laughs> yeah. You know, I mean, relative to this guy, they're right. I mean, and they're not lying. <laughs> you know, he's right. not lying. That type of thing. And I, I don't mind it. It's like everybody has a part to play in this life. You know, my part to play at the poker table is not that of a card shark or a PhD in GTO, you know, yeah. my, my, my role to play is somebody who can contend, have fun sometimes, sometimes be serious, you know, and has the ability to do that. And I, I like my role. I like my part. Well, that's cool. Well, well, knowing all of that, like you're, you're obviously incredibly self-aware with that said, and knowing what your role at the felt is, is there nonetheless like a tournament or a title that you still kind of covet and, and would like to win someday? Yeah, I, I, I tend to dial it and turn it up when there's a challenge or a very high stakes tournament like the Triton series. Um, I think you get not only um, a much higher grade in how I perform relative to what I know, but prior to that, I increase my knowledge base, right? And my training, et cetera, to get there. And so 
in certain events, I'm, I'm, you know, you're like, who the hell is that guy? Who, you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> is that, who that guy is that guy showed up, right? And then certain times, you know, you get me on a TV high stakes cash game. And I'm just like, oh, that's the bill we know and love, you know? So right. uh, um, it, it really depends. Um, I, I really like these high roller tournaments. I'd like to take one down uh, one of these days. Um, I don't, I, I keep saying one of these days, I just do not see a parting in my schedule, you know, to actually put in the time beforehand and then also take out the time to go and do this, this multi-day, multi-day sure. tournament. Sure. Well, I mean, obviously you have achieved an incredible amount in, in your life. What would it mean to you to also, you know, have that moment of I've won this title, like one of the high rollers or a Triton title? Like, how, where would that rank perhaps? Uh, among the achievements, I think, I think it rated. I think it ranked pretty high, right? Like it's, you know, if I go around bragging like, "Oh yeah, I killed it in natural gas. I had the greatest return that past year." Well, I've been doing it for years. Like of course, like of course, right? Like you put in all this time, right? Like this is your area of expertise. We expect you to do that. It's like a receiver catching a thirty yard pass is like you're supposed to catch the ball, right? Right. It hit your hands. You're supposed to catch it, right? Um, but this is one, you know, winning that would be like, you're not supposed to win this. You did something extraordinary that other people are focusing their whole lives on and didn't do. So I, I think in my mind, I think that like means a little, it's a little sweeter, That's cool. you know, I, it's a I little like sweeter. It. I like it. Well, it's funny. Like I, 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 and I have to frame this question a little bit differently now because I was going to frame this question of about are you ever not comfortable at the table because of stakes or in a particular spot? But now I have to ask, you know, like you, you said, you've got this attitude. I don't really give a shit. Right. So <laughs> is that sort of play a role of like, you always play your game or are opponents at all capable of putting you in an uncomfortable spot in any way? So let me clarify that. So the, 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 I don't, give a shit is the your perception of me like the public perception of persona you know some of them are nice and they stroke you going like i care a little bit and some of them are particularly nasty and you're like you're an asshole but it, by and large i have a healthy dose of i don't give a shit right okay. um but do i care about what's going on at the table and what are my chances etc yes because that's part of the game and so um i really uh am concerned put in uncomfortable spots where I'm just like, I don't know the answer to those questions. Like sometimes when I, I, I'm in a spot and it's usually, you know, it doesn't even happen, but it's like, I've made a bet and I'm like, oh my gosh, what am I going to do if he rips all in here? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like and I, I have, I have top middle, you know what I mean? Like, and I'm like, he rips all in, like, what am I going to do here? You know? And I'm just like, my heart's going, cacao, 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 please don't go all in. You know what I mean? Cause right. I don't want to fail the test. Right. Not because I care what people think. I personally just don't want to fail the test. Right. Um, and, and, and at the time, here's the problem when you're on, on uh, live poker and you're playing the game, I can click the button, right? And let's, whether I'm right or wrong, which way I, I decide, whether fold or, or call, right? I don't know the answer till later. It's like I you took the test, the chips go back and forth and you're like, I lost the money, but am I okay with that because I did the right thing? Or, or I made the money, but I'm not okay with that because I did something stupid. You know what I mean? Like I wasn't supposed to do that. Like you don't know the answer until whatever. So it's like, you know, remember when you were a kid and you took a test and it took forever and the teacher was late to getting the grades back and you were like disappointed, <laughs> you know, that's how it feels at the poker table. I'm like, you're just, and you're just sitting there, you know, kind of, at least not you, but me, I'm right. sitting there going, shit, you know, for the rest of the game, like, did I make the right decision or not? Yeah. You know? And you're like that break, you're asking people like, what would you have done? You know, yeah. you won't know until you... <laughs> <laughs> you know, That's you true. see that in the hallways of poker. Yeah, every poker tournament is right. You hear people going over hand histories and like, what are you doing? Well, I think I would have done this if he's this right. type of player or whatever. Like, you're just trying to get to the answer for the test you just took. Right. Well, I, that, I like that a lot. <laughs> right. I, I like that because, you know, that's something that, you know, everyone can kind of relate to. So many times, you know, we hear from the big established pros of you have to get to a place where you just don't care about the money, focus on the game. And, you know, you, you kind of have that luxury in a way of like, you can solely be focused on the game. And like you said, that that test, did I do it right? Did I not? I imagine there may be parallels to that in the business world, like whether you made the right move or not. 
Yeah, I, I definitely. Um, I, I think the answer and the answer gratification, like for for us, it's you know not as definitive as a game uh, with GTO, right? Like there's many more variables of what's going on. You know, we, right. we're always trying to put on the right risk reward bet and the summation of our bet should be positive over time, mm -hmm. right? Um, so we get the answers of whether or not the result went the right way, but we, you know, it's always a post-mortem analysis of like, hey, given all the variables at the time, did we make the right decision, right? Because right. some information comes out later. Cool. I like it. Okay, so we're, we went through your hand and mom. Uh, you know, not going to ask about any particular tournament, but I've noticed that you cashed in lots of different variants of poker. Do you have a, a particular favorite variant, and, and for any reason? I I like uh, I really like the Triton series. Um, I like the mini one drop. Historically, I, I mean, like you know, Holden versus Omaha, or oh, you know, oh, oh, like oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, I, I love and hate, hate Omaha, okay. love and hate it okay. because <laughs> it's. I I see four cards. I see potential. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. And so yeah. it's like it's like wait, why why fold? I I can you know what I mean? Like, um, uh, so it it just has a way of drawing the super gambler in me out, mm -hmm. uh, Omaha, and so. You know, I love it and I hate it. It's a, it's a, it's a great game, but I, I, my, I'm a big, big, big fan of, and and I played um, a uh, short deck. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, I, I, I still just don't understand why we play short deck. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> I, don't, I don't get it. That's like, I mean, I, I'll also play. I was like, why are we playing short deck? I, don't, I just, I just. I think no. it's the same reason that someone like me walks into a casino, passes by a roulette table, says, "Well, why did I put you know ten bucks on yeah. ten? I don't know why. You just do." Yeah. <laughs> my my favorite is no li no limit hold them. Okay, you do like they're very cool. I like no them. That, no, that, that no limit hold them. Okay, yeah. I, I guess that's the ultimate uh, test. Well, how about um, favorite venue, favorite place to play? Wow. Uh, I mean, Vegas has been... I, 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 I loved... Um, wow, this is a good question. I mean, I think it, specialty events, I think is when we played in St. Kitts and we had the event. We had the Alpha 8 way back in the day. Mm. I don't know if you remember those. I uh, recall, Jackson. yes. That was... That was Amazing, but though that's not like a recurring event. You can't really okay. say that. Um, I think playing in London at the Triton was my favorite. Uh, you you, you so really far. looked amazing. You dressed to the nine. Oh yeah. Like, well, they said wear something, you know. And I was like, all right, let me dress like a London bloke. I love it with, with the fedora, <laughs> with the hat and everything. Yeah, yeah. You know, I was like, I'm gonna get into it. But they, the the, pro the production Triton just put together a very good show. Right. So as a, you know, I felt like all the players were treat, being treated like world class athletes or world class mm -hmm. professionals. Right. It's like the Super Bowl or the NFL, like everything's nice and this is lined up and procedures, et cetera. So I was very, very happy with that. Um, and then, of course, Vegas. I love Vegas. Yeah. <laughs> is there a particular room where you know, that just does it for you that you just appreciate? I don't know what the staff or you know the the, the ambiance. Like what is? It? I mean, like, I, oh, I, I oh, this is fun. I'm a big I'm a big fan of Ivy's room. I don't even know if they call it Ivy's room anymore. Um, I think it's uh, Table One or something at Aria. Right? Uh, yeah, 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 Table yeah. One or whatever. So uh, I, I really, I mean, it just feels. I've I've spent so much time there, and they're real, the staff is really good, and food, you know, food comes in from all over, and nice. an assortment, a motley assortment of characters comes to play. So I, I really like that. I like it. Well, so shout out to Sean McCormick, uh, our good friend. He was, I think, episode two uh, that we recorded here on Cards Chat, uh, the poker boss at, uh, at Aria. Um, you know, some question that we always ask uh, all of our guests here on the Cards Chat podcast, um, you know, it's the friendliest poker podcast in town. So who is the friendliest poker player you've ever had the pleasure of competing against? Wow. Uh, I didn't get to do it live, but um, I think... It's it's a toss up between Ike, Phil Galfon, and um, I think Matt Boyd, or like I think like the friendliest poker guys. 
out there. I, 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 I can't yeah. Bill Galfon, Matt Boyd. I, I think that that's kind of the toss up right there. Okay, cool. We will accept any uh, any particular uh, reason yeah. or what, what 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 does it make you feel inside when you sit down I, at the table with them? I, I think just think Ike is like um, he's just kind of like even killed. He has his print. You know, a lot of people like he has his own political a place on the political spectrum. But I just feel like he's a good guy. He cares. You know what I mean? Um, he he just seems you know just friendly, willing to discuss things. I, I remember when I would like ask him questions, he'd, he'd always like answer the question. I'd run out of money. I can I borrow some money? Sure. You know what I mean? Like, you know, I, I remember in the PCA, I was like, dad, I need some more money. You know, I was calling him dad because he kept, me, kept busting and re-entering in the tournament, you know, yeah. but you know, he's just always been, you know, offered advice or answered questions, et cetera. Um, he seems even keel. Matt Boyd is just a great teacher. Uh, I, I, I've, I've never um, interacted for at least 30, 40, 30, 30 something years with a teacher as um, good as Matt. And I think that's a lot of patience and understanding and encouragement that goes along with that. So, uh, and Phil's just a damn nice guy. Everybody knows. <laughs> Everybody knows. We'll talk a little bit more about Phil uh, momentarily. It's a little uh, later on in our questions. Uh, what a pivot a little bit. You got to change gears every so often in poker. So we'll do that here with our questions. Um, much of your hedge fund work is in the energy sector. We're not going to go too deep, but just sort of wondering what is it that, that drew you to that in particular? I think um, it was the, you know, I had no real... Like some people, like not since I was a young kid, like I want to be an astronaut, right? Like I wanted to be an astronaut. There was a thing I wanted to do. Um, and then once that kind of like astronaut thing went away, right? I, I only just wanted to do what I wanted to do. I just wanted freedom more than anything else. So I just wanted to be rich, right? <laughs> I, quoted, I, quoted, I quoted money with, you know, I, I just wanted to be able to do what I wanted to do. If I wanted to do, go into the movie business, I wanted to have money to make a movie. If I wanted to go here and travel, I wanted to have money to travel, right? And so I equated uh, financial success with freedom. Um, and when I saw the exchange floor, the, the chaos and the rapid fortunes made and lost and um the risk taking it was just an instant appeal to me um i knew i i instantly knew this is something that i could be great at not just good and that it could afford me a chance to for my goal which my goal at that time was just freedom and, and mainly to get the girls right like it's like i joined the band to get the girls you know what i mean like i got rich to get the girls you know what i mean like I travel you know but you know <laughs> That, you know, when you're young, you're 21, and you know, and I said, like, why did you do it? I did it for the girls, you know? <laughs> like, and so, uh, you know, I, I'm addicted to puzzles. I, th I think I realize, you know, I, I like puzzles. Um, and, you know, commodities trading uh, is in business, you know, they're all various, they're just puzzles, right? Just solving right. a puzzle. Like, right. How do we get, make this faster, better, cheaper for this customer? Or how do I, how do I, figure out what the fair value of this, this, this commodity should be given the supply and demand. And it's right. a constantly evolving puzzle. So it, it, it satisfied an addiction and provided me a chance to, to get the girls, you know? Right. And so I was happy. <laughs> right. Well, I think, I think one could fairly, you know, obviously say you've achieved that you've gotten, you know, the wealth, you've gotten the liberty to do whatever you want to do with your time. And yet you choose to still work. A little bit. So that's, that's interesting to me. Why? What is it that motivates you to like still show up for work each day? I think I think the, 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 the main thing is, is that if I cannot identify something that I cannot afford in, in the few, you know, over the arc of my life, then I make a judgment call of whether or not it's working for it. Right. Like what is the tax on my time in order to pursue this goal? Right. And, and then things like, so if I, if I shut down work now and I was like, whatever, all right, like what things go away and how much is the tax of working for me, right? And so I, I've been able to, you know, technology has been kind of great for me because I can work from anywhere. Like I, people always complain like, oh, you're, how do you work from your boat? I was like, well, everything I need is on my phone. 
all my trading apps, all the technology, everything. I DocuSign, you know what right. I mean? Right. <laughs> or DocuSign some, and now there's a new company, HelloSign, you know, I bought a house. It's like, here, hello, sign this, you know? Right. So, <laughs> you know, it's not, it, you know, over the past uh, 12 years, the ability to make work um, less painful for me, uh, particularly knowledge workers, right, has accelerated, right? And so th- when I do that, that judgment of like, okay, um, you could stop working, you'd lose these things, you know, what that, 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 that cost benefit analysis in terms of my time and fulfillment and the things I want out of my life, uh, the, the cost of work has gone down significantly. Now, there's still a cost. Um, you know, even when I'm traveling, right? Like I, I go to Europe and I travel for a couple months, you know, I'm kind of quarter present some days or kind of half present. Sure. So yeah, I'm in this beautiful area, blah, blah, blah. But you're kind of half present because your your neurons are firing thinking about this problem, right? They're not just completely right. like, I have nothing to do with that, right? Uh, and so, and then the fact that I can always be in contact with work, well, they can always be in contact with me. You know what I mean? It works both ways, right? <laughs> and, and, and so, you know, that's something that I weigh out constantly. Mm-hmm. Uh, but event, eventually, um, just because I'm aging, that, you know, the cost of work goes higher and higher and higher until it's like, no, it's over. Right. Right, well, we'll talk more about the uh, the dive with zero. And, you know, I remember hearing a couple other interviews where you talked about time buckets. So that seems right. to be a, a consistent answer uh, with that. But it's a very, very intriguing. I also have to just, uh, you know, full, full disclosure, everyone. You know, I was like, when I approached uh, Bill about, you know, doing the interview, he said right away. But obviously the, well, where exactly is Bill? What's the time zone that he's in? So yeah, 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 yeah. an interesting thing to coordinate. So it's, it's pretty cool. And um I got to say also the whole like um, idea of liberty to, to do what you want when you want, work from wherever you want. Uh, I think that's something that a lot of people identify with, but I know it certainly uh, resonates very heavily with me. So it's a very instructive answer uh, and uh, insightful one. Thank you very much for answering that question. Um, yeah, I think that's a lo- reason why a lot of people go into the poker field. Why, why yeah, it's so attractive exactly. to them. Like, I got my own schedule, I show up, whatever. Like, it has a huge cost and you might oh, not yeah. make it, but like, that sense of freedom is really attractive to people. Oh yeah, even even if you're not a player, uh, you know, if you're in the industry, that that exists a lot. So uh, I can I can vouch for that. Um, let's talk film production. So this was an interesting <laughs> one. Just about ten years ago, you became involved in film production. There was one in particular. I remember seeing the film Unthinkable with Samuel L. Jackson. I liked it. So a lot of people, what they do is they oh, let's look for IMDb and Wikipedia. And I saw, wait a minute, it says producer Bill Perkins. I'm like, wait, I that's I know Bill Perkins. That's the yeah. same guy. So what what led to being involved in film production in general and, and that project in particular? I think like one of the things that when I was a kid, it's like, what do you want to do? It's like, I want to make movies. Well, I want to be a movie star or whatever. Right. Like that type of thing. Like I had like the little camera and, you know, like super eight, whatever, and never really edited it, but, you know, make, tried to make movies. And I was like, I'm going to make this. And I remember writing to Dino De Laurentiis, you know, like, Hey, can you, you know, uh, send me one of the guns you used in this movie, space guns. I want to show you a movie. It never got to him, right? He was like a production office, which shuts down all the time. But anyway, um, when I got, when I finally got rich, I was like, well, um, a friend had made a movie called Better Luck Tomorrow. Um, He told me he made it for a million bucks. MTV Films bought it. I was like, that was a pretty good film. I could lose a million dollars. I want to go into movie business. You know what I mean? Here I am, I'm going to go into movie business, like not knowing anything about it, but just a rich guy thinking like, I want to go into movie business. This is one of the things I want to do. Um, and I think unthinkable was like, you're the movie, you're the producer, you own the movie, but the first movie you make, you're really just kind of the rich guy with the money. You know, you're, you're the boss, but you don't know what the hell you're doing. You know, you're kind of learning by doing and people are nice to you because you're paying them, but you don't know squat. <laughs> you know what I mean? You just kind of like, they listen to you, but like, yeah, yeah, yeah. We really don't want to do that. Right. And so, but I did realize that I love the creative process and I love making movies and it was sexy and yada, yada, yada. So there I was in the movie rabbit hole. <laughs> Interesting. So, I mean, like, obviously um, one of the things that successful people 
generally speaking, tend to do is surround themselves with good, intelligent, smart, you know, that type of people, you know, you don't want to be the smartest one in the room, that kind of thing. So, you know, it seems that that first film was, was more of like a learning experience for you. How did you decide whom would be, you know, your, your posse, your people with whom you'd, you know, take on this project? Well, I'd even say first the last film, I think it's always a learning experience in the creative industry, you know, um, but I think I was guided by like ICM. So my, my agents were a uh, film packaging division and ICM. They kind of like put these people around you that have made films or actors, or at least some element that you're going to get value from. Mm -hmm. Right. And then I remember seeking out um, Ram Bergman uh, back in the day. So I, I, Ram Bergman made a movie called Brick way back in the day. It's a, it's a great film made for like almost no money. Right. That kind of put him on the map and we're like, I want to work with this guy because I want to know how he did this, this movie, how do he put out this quality movie at this price, et cetera. And then, you know, you, you, you find people in the industry of certain talent and skill um, to do that. I think um, Ram Dead did the Brothers Bloom. You know, he has had a great career, you know, moved himself up the ranks, et cetera. But like, that's kind of what was my approach to the movie business is like, I'm just going to go out there and fire, you know, and I'm going to try and make movies. Uh, I realize that I'm most likely vaporizing my money here and, um, you know, I'm going to get this out of it. Right. Okay. Well, that's fair. And when you say ICM, we're not talking about the independent shit model, just to be clear. No, no, no. We're talking that's about international that. creative management. We're talking about okay. CAA, ICM. Those are, you know, the big, big, the big guys out there. Just to be, I know we just got a lot of poker purists. Poker, poker heads out there. They're like, what, ICM, what does the chip model have to do with movies now? Right. <laughs> exactly. I will pivot back to poker. We'll talk about uh, the Thirst Lounge, a Twitch channel. So for those uh, who didn't know what it was, maybe you can give us a, another 30 second recap. And, and what was sort of your motivation for, for putting that together? I, I felt like, you know, um, with poker kind of like in this legal limbo, et cetera, right? We were missing out on some poker entertainment. And I thought it'd be really good to see if, you know, streaming was coming along and Jeff Gross was like, you know, streaming, oh, he's like a stream nut, right? Yep. And I was, uh, he's like, you should try streaming. And I thought it was great, but like any endeavor, streaming is a lot of work, oh, yeah. right? And, and streaming is actually more work than I think just putting out content and a creative content like a movie, et cetera, because your viewers want you, you interact with the viewers on stream, right? Like they, they, they expect you to show up and, and be a certain way, et cetera. And I, I realized that I can't give them what they want, right? So I had, I said, I'm going to pivot. The Thirst Lounge was just kind of like, um, the name the Thirst Lounge comes from an ex-girlfriend where she was like, your, in your Instagram is just a thirst trap. You just... Girls trying to girls in bikinis trying to trap guys, guys with nice things, you know, trying to trap girls. And I was like, I don't want to trap anybody. Right. I want them to lounge. I want them to come and visit, but right. I don't want to trap them. So I called it the thirst lounge. You know what I mean? Okay. Instead of the thirst trap. <laughs> and so that was my streaming show. But realizing that I couldn't do it, you know, I was like, hey, there's all these streamers out there. What if we? What if we give them bankroll and a house, kind of like MTV type yep. show in the yep. Caribbean and follow them on and off the felt, but let them control it. Let it be their thing. Right. Uh, and, and that's what it was. It was like this big experiment on um, running it. You know, we got we got sponsors. You know, Rob was really, really uh, good about that. And um you know, they're still out there, you know, so some of them, some of them came and like streaming's not for me. You know what I mean? It's like, it's a lot of work and setting up the equipment and being on and talking for hours at end while playing is not for me. And some of them five, right. Yeah. And have gone on out there. You know, you see, I think particularly you see uh, Drew and uh, Ebony and John out there really hitting it hard. And some other people kind of tangentially still involved like Matt, and Adam, like they, we also did, thir we also did a thing called the uh, uh, the coin flip, the coin flip trip. That one. What was that? Well, it's a, it was an idea that um, it was another great idea that was kind of like, hey, you know, I get a lot of people that say, oh, it's easy for you to do. You have money to travel here or there, okay. right? Okay. And I, I thought like, let's take two these two guys, 
go all around the globe, and then they would flip a coin on what their budget was per day. Wow. So sometimes it'd be low. Like I think it was like $25 a day or, 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 or 25 or 50. It's, it's either, and then a high would be $500 a day, right? right? So there were many flips where they were like flipped 25, you know what I mean? They flipped really low in very expensive cities and they had to figure it out. Right. And, and you, there was, uh, the, the producer was figuring it out, you know, like right. then you go out and then they flip high and they have, you know, live high on the hog or wherever they were. And so they went around the globe and it was kind of like a pilot of like, this would be a great idea. Like, okay, here we go. You know, you, 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 you flip the coin and here we go. And so they had this adventure. It was documented. It's filmed. Um, it's out there on YouTube. You can just Google coin flip trip. I, it, I, I think we'll do that right after we finish recording. It sounds very yeah, yeah, yeah. You, like, these are just concepts I put out there that I thought would be entertaining, you know, and yeah. I thought the first lounge would like be a nice base for young streamers to mm-hmm. improve their poker game, improve their, their media interaction and, in a great environment that people would like love to see kind of like a, a poker as a lifestyle show. Sure. Right. It seems, it seems like you kind of have this uh, proud pop of life about it. Yeah. I mean, I feel good about it. I mean, you know, I've always told the guys, you know, in the beginning, I was like, this is your show. Like, it is what you make of it. Like, it can be terrible. It could be great. It could be a launch pad. It could be an experiment where you figure like, I don't want to be here. Right. Right. And it's going to be what it is. And I, I love those things. You know, I'm That's always awesome. like. I love, I mean, my, one of my favorite sayings is why guess what we can know. And it's something I say in trading all the time, like go figure out the piece of information. Like if maybe it's expensive, tell me the cost, like why guess what we can know. And so I'm like, well, let's just figure it out. (laughs) You know what I mean? Like, you know, kind of like Chris Berman, that's why they play the game, you know, that type of thing, (laughs) you know, so like, will this work? I'm like, I don't know if it'll work, but we're going to try, you know, so that type of thing. That's cool. I like it. Very nice. Well, we, we said we'd mention uh, Mr. Gelfon, uh, so we got to do so in context of the Gelfon Challenge. Uh, you are a participant. Uh, the challenge is to play 50,000 hands of PLO at 100, 200 with some large side bets at stake. Uh, why did you decide? Why did you decide to take the challenge on? I, I just love challenges. Um, I think like if you if you he's Phil Gelfon though. He is. I mean, <laughs> this is. You know, um, this is a thing where you can get with close enough to be with inside variance and win. You know what I mean? Like, I, I don't think I'm going to get a lucky punch and knock out Mike Tyson. Like, if I, if even my luckiest punch, I might get a good right cross. But right. that's it. He's still going to come and demolish me, you know? And so... You know, poker's not like that. You get close, you can knock somebody out and you can win. Um, and, you know, I do believe that when I am focused, like I'm elite. Um, I just need the time to get there. And I felt like I can get close. And I love challenges. I think challenges are one of ways that helps bring that instinct out in me. You know, I, I think, uh, you know, I'm comfortable. I'm lazy. I feel like I don't want to study. I don't have this thing. You know, right. I'm that guy, right? Like I have a healthy, lazy gene. I got a really big, lazy gene. And But you bring out a challenge. I, I get to shrug that off a little bit, you know, and put in the work. And so that aspect alone is why I like challenges. I like it. Very cool. Well, you know, 50, I mean, 000, yeah, go ahead. I, I'm sorry. I just, I just want to point like. You know, people are like, oh, I hate this team. And we're going to, you know, when you're on a football team or something like that, whatever. And like, nobody wants to go and play against, you know, a college team wants to go play against a bunch of high schoolers. That's not fun. Right. You know, we won. We just demolished them the 185. Like, that's not fun, right? You want competition, right? Like, I was always thankful for the competition. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like, these are the people that push me to work and get better at my craft, et cetera. So, like. I don't want, I mean, professionally, like if I got to eat and my goal is something different, yeah, I, I want to play the, like the worst poker player in the world and just take all the money, right? He might as well just dump it into my pocket. But uh, from another standpoint of like to elevate my game and a challenge and a sense of like accomplishment, like I want to play the most capable people. Very cool. Well, you've played um, an astounding 862 
<laughs> out of, <laughs> of 50,000 hands. I believe he did the challenge against Benny Beattie was 25,000 hands. And that took a few months. This seems like it could take a while. Uh, when exactly do you think your next session would be? Or, I mean, I, I mean you, you're well, not, you know, you got your time buckets and stuff. Like, yeah, let, I think we might have to redo it because I paid out on all the challenges. I mean, I think, I pay, at least on the side bets, like, what happened was is this, is that it became impossible to play the challenge based on locations, rules, laws, citizenship, et cetera. And so there was like, um, we were trying to play on a platform. I, I, even my party Parker account is blocked. It's like, well, you have, they, they're like, you have to go and show up in St. Kitts with the newspaper. Well, you can't even get in, like for years, you couldn't even get into St. Kitts with a newspaper because of the COVID, they had all these massive restrictions, restrictions, yeah, right? Yeah, and like, yeah. like, like, I'm not going to go there, quarantine for two weeks in some place, whatever. Just to, to play you know, online, even sure. though I have a passport or whatever. So, the, you know, the the it's and it's not party poker's fault. It's the the owners' regs and what's going on, right? Like, they're really paranoid, and their legal department is paranoid. So they they have this like we're taking no shit, you know, type of thing. Like, yeah. show me show me your house or show me your path, you know, type of thing. And I, I just couldn't play, you know what I mean? Yeah. And, 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 you know, I'd have to take my boat and go into like the Sir Francis Drake channel and then play there to get on the BBI. It, it was just, it was just an ordeal. And so it became impossible. Uh, hopefully in the future that will change for all those poker players. And, you know, I can play as many challenges from the, the comfort of my own home, you know, <laughs> I hope so too. Well, Phil also has. Uh, you may have heard from him once. Uh, he's got his yeah. own site, so maybe that'll make it. Uh, no, even even possible. even that, that was actually an, uh, an option, and we talked about that. And I had to. There was a legal clause in there that the lawyers were like, "No, you can't do that because you're going to mm -hmm. totally destroy your whole." You're like you can't you can't say this on one thing saying, "I I am not I'm a I'm a tax resident of X," and then you. Uh, you know what I mean? Like it was, it was just, there's always loops. It's always lawyers. It's always I lawyers. Hear. I hear. My <laughs> wife's a lawyer, but I love her, but I can just say. Yeah, yeah. No, no. I mean, it's like, it's like lawyers in German. I mean, the law is, it's the law. You know what I mean? It's like all these yeah. rules and regulations they of put course, in there. Got to respect the law. All right, mm -hmm. Mr. Mr. Perkins, we're going to die with zero. Uh, last year you published uh, your book, Die with Zero. It talks about getting the most out of your money. Uh, what led you to write the book? Because obviously you didn't do it to make money. So what, what is it that's like, I want to write this book? Well, the, the main thing I was working on before that was a, a program. What I wanted to do is get a team of programmers to kind of like help me build this model to die with zero. Like I, I, in my mind, I had this idea, right? I've been talking about this whole idea, philosophy, and like, how do I quantify this? And, and, and I was like, I want to wake up every day and, or, and it tells me how much I should be spending on leisure per week, per whatever, per category, like athletic leisure, non-athletic leisure, et cetera. I had this whole really detailed thing I wanted so that I would just easily be like on model, right? Like optimizing my spend pattern throughout my life. And um, long story short, my doctor, when doing a psychological exam, when I said, yeah, I hope I die with zero. And I went into a spiel. He's like, you got to write a book. And I was like, yeah, you're right. I do write a book. It's, it's, it's the mental models that matter. And so I wanted to get the, the concept across. You know, I wrote the book and I was building the model to save my own life, right? And I wrote the book to my life mainly, but other people's lives, to save people's lives. And when I say that, people are like, what the fuck are you talking about, Bill Perkins, save people's lives? It's a book about net fulfillment over net worth. And, you know, my, in my head, when you save somebody who drowns, right, um, they're still going to die. They're just not going to die that day, right? You're just giving them the opportunity to have more experiences, more choices before they die, before they're, you know, they act, you know they, they're, in, they're in the grave. And so what you're really giving them when you save their life is more experiences, more and so my book is an optimization book that gives you more experiences so you don't waste your life, right? You don't look back in your life and like, shit, in my 50s, I should have done X, Y, and Z, and I didn't do it. I just was 
doing X, Y, and Z. This, I was on autopilot and I missed out, right? And so I'm, I look at it as like, I'm saving your life. I'm saving I your think, life. So I think the pitch is pretty clear why someone should buy it. Uh, I'm curious about yourself. Once you started thinking about money and life in this way, what sort of adjustments, if any, did you make to how you had been living before? I, I, it took a while for me to get to like the final like adjustments, but like even when I was dead busted broke as a screen clerk on the floor, I was thinking about like, what is it all for? Like, I'm trying to get rich, but by when, you know what I mean? Like most people are like, I want to be rich by I'm 30 or 40. Nobody says, I want to be rich at 97. Like that doesn't come out of people's mouths or 96 or even 86, right? right. Like, and, and, and they're inherent in that answer, like before X, is a reason, right? It's because I'm healthy. I'm able to do these things. It's in the right time. There's a concept of the time period and the time bucket. And so over the years, kind of this thinking of like, okay, when is the peak utility of money in my life? When did it have, when does it have zero value? Okay. When I was born, it didn't have any value like right. to me. Right. And when I'm like on my deathbed that has zero value to me, right. My ability to convert it into experiences. So there's some sort of curve in here. Right. And there's right. some sort of peak. Right. And so therefore, a dollar at that peak is worth more than a dollar at any of the extremes. Right. And so then there's this natural slope. And then I was like, wait a minute, then it's almost like friction. Like, you know, there's this, this, like you keep trying to make more money, but has less and less utility. Right. So then you're working for nothing. Right. And then I was like, oh, there's a spend curve. So these these uh, these thoughts. Right. And like, how do I quantify them had gone on in my in my head for a long, long time. Um, and you know, I was thinking of the implications of these, these, this, this situation. What does that mean? Like, how should I be thinking about my life? And how, when do I allocate these activities? And how do I, how do I order my life? And so that's the book, right? That's the book right. on like, you know, it's like, if you, if you look at many books, like concepts are very simple, right? E equals MC squared is very simple. The implications right. are <laughs> mind blowing. You know what I mean? Like, exactly. right? Force, force equals MA is a very simple formula, mind-blowing implications, right? You know, so uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the whole book is about the implications and the mental models for you to get the maximum out of your life, like for it. me to get the maximum out of my life, you know? Right. Very cool. Well, um, our community in Card Shack had of questions for you. So I'm just going to ask a couple of more of mine. I uh, see, uh, you know, just to make sure we optimize the remaining time we've got here uh, yeah. so we can get as many of those in first. But uh, another couple for me, uh, we've got to talk prop bets. Uh, you've been in enough involved in a number of crazy prop bets. Dan Bilzerian, Jamie Staples, Adam Schwartz, you know, uh, Antonio Svandiar, just so many of them. Um, you know, the stakes don't seem to really matter to you. So what are you hoping to get out of winning a, a bet with one of these folks? Um, I like to see incredible things or max punishment type of entertainment. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> how much do I got to pay this person to do this silly thing? And I might win, you know what I mean? I might win, but you know, they're going to go do this silly thing, right? And, um, uh, but then also there's like incredible feats and challenges that also create a, a ripple effect, like Jamie Staples, right? And and yeah. and, and that bat, right? Whether, uh, you know, that, hey, you can do it, he can do it, then you can do it. Like, I think a lot right. of people are like, well, if he can do it, I can do it type of thing. And that's great. That's not a bad thing. That's like, yeah, yeah, you're right. You know, and these are the, these are the benefits. Mm -hmm. um, it's usually human versus very difficult, near impossible feat, right? Right. You know, right. like for, for them, right? Like other people are like, oh, I could do that. No problem. Of course, that's what you've been doing your whole damn life. You know right. what I mean? But like for them, right? Like slightly it, within their reach, but it's going to take a discipline. Like most of the bets that I challenge people are, are not that it's impossible for them. It's a discipline bet. I like they're, very I like they're very disciplined bets. Very, very much, you know, methodical like if you do this you're going to make it right right is there a particular uh bet you're involved in with you know now and if you say with whom what it's about yeah i'm actually the guinea pig this time i have oh. to get to nine percent body fat via dexa scan by april the 23rd dan blazarian two hundred thousand. i think uh charlie hook has a piece against me i think it's 37 or fifty thousand, and i think somebody else has like I think Dan Smith has some money against me. 
like 16,000 or something like that. I can never remember. I always rely on honest people to tell me what my bets are, but like <laughs> I, I'm, I'm in the process of that bet right now. Cause okay. I, 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 over the summer, I got pre for, I got way out of shape for me. Um, and yeah, like you said, for, for me, because you are, you know, again, you're, you're over 50, you're pretty damn in shape and you know, you take yeah. care of yourself. Yeah. And, but I was, I was eating like a prisoner on death row and, um, <laughs> and those habits formed during the pandemic when I thought like, oh, we're all going to die. Like in the beginning right. of the pandemic, it was like, oh shit, I got like a 20 something percent chance of dying in the next three, three years. Right. Like that was like the stats coming out, the early stats. Right. And I was just like, well, there's no long term. Let's eat. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> so I, I created these habits that lasted right into the yeah. next summer. Turn around. I weighed myself one time. I like, I shit you not. I almost cried. Oh, yeah. I was like, uh, you know, and I was like, wait, there is a long term, and I'm now hurting my own long term, right? right. Versus off. And so uh, Dan was like, you know, it's like I'm gonna get in shape, and he's like, I bet you, you don't, whatever. And I was like, let's go. I love to. Okay. You know what I mean? Let's go. I love these okay. challenges, and so, so I'm in the middle of that. Well, good luck with the challenge. Sincerely, Thank I you. really hope you get there. Uh, and last question for me. So besides, uh, you know, making 9% body fat by April next year, uh, what else are you sort of up to that you care to uh, share with our audience here? Any plans to poker wise and any anything like that? I'm hoping there's a there's a 50K uh, Poker Goes hosting on December the 20th, I think. Mm -hmm. I hope I can make that. I, I said I'm coming. I want to go. Uh, I really, really, really want to go. I miss poker. Although I'm terrible now. I'm like, I, I just was using the app and I'm just like, I, I, I forgot. I don't know. I guess it's part of aging, you know, like I'm not as mentally sharp. I stopped playing chess for like three months. I'm like, I dropped 200 points. I'm like, wait, what? You know? So uh, I, I want to get back in the ring and then shake off. Yeah. I want to get back in the ring, dust, dust these cobwebs off and have, have nice. some fun. Um, and then I have two startups going. I'm very happy. I just hired a CEO. They're there, I'll, I'll be able to announce them in, in a little bit, but uh, it's, you know, I'm excited about that. They're, they're in, um, I'll say they're in earth observation business. Interesting, intriguing. You heard it here first, folks. Earth <laughs> observation. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Cool. Well, in this segment of the show, we turn to you guys, our Cards Chat community, to see what questions you want to ask our guests. We have a dedicated thread on the Cards Chat forums for this. So as we announce who our future guests will be, please be sure to send in your questions. We'll try to get in as many as possible in the time we got remaining. Uh, Shells, thank you very much for these questions. Um, Shells wants to know, Bill, what is or was the most bizarre prop bet you had ever proposed? Oh, wow. Oh, wow, wow. I, I think the one that I, I, you know, my staff was like, you can't do this. You can't even. No, it, it was it was the the lights on three days in a four days it's like four or five days in a room lights on no human contact type bet and I, I know it doesn't sound that bizarre but it's bizarre because like you you go crazy like even if you don't completely go crazy like you you it changes your brain and um I, I'm, I'm I, I I don't think you know, people like, oh yeah, I'm going to do it. We're going to build this whole box where they live in and it's, lights are always on. There's nothing, your food comes whenever it comes, like you get fed and you just stay in there. Nothing to read, nothing to do. And the door is open. You can always walk out the door. Ooh. And if you open the door, it's over. Right. Right. And you have to stay there for, for X time. And we open the door when it's over. Right. And so, uh, that that I think is the most bizarre one proposed, uh, dangerous one too. At that, I would say. Yeah, that's uh, interesting. Did you is that like like go go jump in like you know I've seen people like at, at the Bahamas like jump in the shark cage and jump back up like right. it's kind of idiotic but it's not as dangerous as like this can cause like you might come out of there like you know. Sure. sure. <laughs> okay. Wow, that's a crazy one. Um, well, this one's in, in particularly interesting to me. Uh, thank you again, Shells, for this question because uh, I know you know you, you do you know you're very um, optimizing time buckets and you got your schedule and everything. So Shells wants to know what do you like to do most when you have free time? Wow, I really like traveling and exploring other cultures, cities, civilizations, etc. I think uh, I've said it before. Other people said it. The cliche. Uh, travel is one of the few things you spend money on that makes you richer. Mm -hmm. um, I love that. 
I just recently got addicted to wake surfing. I used to be wakeboarder. Um, I could never let go of the rope wake surfing. And then, you know, Phil Locke and guys are like, no, you're going to come out. I was like, I can't give it. I don't want to do it. And then once I got up, um, you know, the learning curve is pretty quick. And now yeah. I'm addicted. So I, love, I like wake surfing. I love right. traveling. Fun. Good, good habits uh, and hobbies, rather. Sorry. Um, Crystals. Thank you very much, Crystals, for these questions. Uh, Bill, Crystal wants to know, how did you meet Lara? I met Lara in Cabo. Uh, it was really just a boondog. I was partying. It was straight party, party, party. And, I, I, you know, some people stick together and we stuck. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like we, we just, we stuck. And, you know, I, I think, um, you know, Lara's obviously attractive, but she's super kind and self-aware and she has a very high emotional intelligence. And I think that was something I needed in my life. You know, just that kindness. Um, and we just hang tight. She rolls with the punches and she's hella fun. So, you know, we decided, you know, I think certain people have the idea that, um, I've gone from meeting Lara to a whole story, but uh, sure. some people have a story, like they have a belief weight, like you find somebody and you find your, your your relationship, you know? And I have a thing like you build your relationship. So we built our relationship brick by brick. And I, I'm, a, I'm a believer that relationships are built, not found. I like that. That's a, I, that's a very complete answer to that question. I yeah, like yeah. it a lot. Um, second one from Crystal's, well, no, no, I guess the complete other side of the spectrum here. What is your biggest regret in life? Crystal's wants to know. Wow. I, I, I mean, it's a combination of not doing my best in, in prior to like 21, like mm. in almost everything, <laughs> you know, I was a very big slacker of uh, just, just, I mean, literally the definition of slacker would be me. I'd be like at least the first or third through third definition of slacker. Um, but I, I think it would be the times that I've hurt people, um, you, you know, raise my voice in anger or hurt them in, unintentionally or intentionally. That, those, would, that, th th those are like, I think, tied, right? And I think, right. I think it's a version of not doing your best. It's like not doing your best to like diffuse yourself and control your anger. So, yeah. so like, that's kind of a subset of not doing your best. Um, um, but those are, those are my biggest regrets. I love how your answers aren't just, you know, personal, uh, you know, confessions or anything. But I feel like there's so much to learn from the way and, and the content in which you're answering these questions. Thank you very much. That's just me Thanks. inserting a little bit there. So it's very cool. Um, Antonis, three, two, one, two, three. A very interesting question here. Uh, thank you, Antonis. Um, okay, he's he's read your book um, and wants to know, Bill, how does your hero in Die With Zero um, do that during the pandemic? Live for the day? How does he adapt to these hard conditions financially and otherwise? How does he keep on moving like a shark instead of dying, as you said? Yeah, I, I, I think, you know, I think that's a good question. I think everybody, you know, no one's coming to save you. No one's coming to rescue. I think like that's a kind of a, a thing. I mean, like I, in my experience, unless you're an extremely attractive woman, nobody's coming to rescue you. <laughs> uh, so, <laughs> and, and so um, you have to assess what you have, what, whatever variables you have. And I, in my book, The Die With Zero, it's your wealth, your health, and your time. And it's like, how are we going to allocate them? Are we going to be spending a lot of time are we going to be spending a lot of money? Are we going to be, you know, utilizing our health? Like those variables, how do I maximize, maximize my fulfillment at this point in my life? And how does that look on a go forward basis? And so I think it's situation agnostics. The situation is the situation. You get these variables and then you have to play the cards you have at that time to make them better. And I think the main thing is to be off autopilot, not just accepting things, but like really deeply thinking about like, okay, what do I want? What can I achieve? What, what's, what's available to me given these, you know, these circumstances and the resources I have and what things do I need to be working on? Do I need to be building wealth and spending time or do I need to be spending wealth at whatever time? Or if I, like me, I was, you know, I was like the rest of us, I can't travel anywhere. I like went to the maps, called many of my resources, who will accept me? Croatia, we're going. You know what I mean? Like, you know, I didn't just sit there and accept it. You know, I dug. And if had I dug, I would have been like, okay, we're going to do this with my family. I'm going to walk and I'm going to hike. I'm going to get, 
you know, I'm going to do X, Y, and Z, and this is how I'm going to enjoy my life. Unfortunately, one of those things how I was going to enjoy my life was I'm going to stuff my fucking face (laughs) because we're going to die, you know? And then I'm like, wait, we're not going to die, you know? (laughs) And as a matter of fact, stuffing my face might actually accelerate my death. So, you know, so increase my chances of dying with respect to COVID. So, um, you know, but either way, that exercise is what you do. Right. And I like what that what you said. Um, you don't need to have any particular amount or lack thereof of wealth. This is a, a philosophy that pretty much Correct. anyone could adopt. Correct. Correct. This is a this is a model, not a not a like a how to spend your money book. This is a how to model your life book. Right. right. So when you have zero money or if you know a, a you know a, ungodly amount of money, right? This is how do I model given those resources. I like it. Well, so so uh, Antonis' second question here, I think I may know what the answer is, but now I'm exceptionally curious, uh, wants to know if you knew that your time was up at 80 years old, but you had the opportunity to live an additional 10 years with the catch that you'd be extremely poor, would you still want to keep living? Why or why not? A hundred thousand percent. Um, <laughs> I would definitely still w- want to keep living. And one thing um, I, you know, I've understand is like, if you have your health, like that variable is like the one thing that cannot be zero, right? After that, you can still create fulfillment. And mm. having traveled the world, uh, there's two things I've noticed. Um, everything I've done, somebody is doing it who's poor. Mm. Everything. Wow. They, they, they've stretched it together. They, you know, they found a way, they hustled, they did a little job on a the side, they're there. Right. And they're, they're absorbing and observing the same universe that I am observing. Right. Maybe they didn't get that way. Maybe they took the ferry over. Right. right. When right. I took a private boat. Right. But they are doing things. things. If you go to Europe and you're in Australia, you'll see tons of gap year students backpacking broke as a joke, you know, working at night at working at McDonald's, saving up the money and then planning to go backpack through China. Right. Um, and then also when I go to like places where people are extremely poor, like when I went to Thailand, I was like, they're happier than me. These people right here are visibly happier than me. They are doing something better. And I think what they're doing better is their outlook on life and how they think about life, but they are happier. They're enjoying their ride. And so I believe that I'm the type of person that I've wired myself. I don't think, you know, you can get programmed. We're human beings. We all get programmed. Um, You can get programmed to be like negative and not enjoy life given X circumstance or Y circumstances. Like obviously there's certain circumstances that humans start to break, right? But we endure and we survive. And I think that if you have a certain mindset, you can thrive in most, almost any, you know, a very wide set of circumstances. Again, an exceptionally complete answer. And dare I say, if there's a couple minutes of this show that people should re-listen to, I think perhaps uh, those are those, uh, you know, couple of highlight minutes there. Um, our last uh, community member who sent in questions, Acid Burn FX. Thank you very much for these questions. We'll do them maybe two more. Uh, Bill, what is the worst job you've ever had and why didn't you like it? Wow, the worst job was it Burger King? No. <laughs> I, I mean, well, okay. I'm gonna, I'm gonna go. Uh, I'm gonna go way back, but like, I, I think it'd be a, like kind of a bad answer, and I'll try and uh, bring it forward. Um, I was a uh, what? What's the guy who has to bring the dishes? You know, and the waitresses tip out. A busboy. I was a busboy, um, but I was not strong enough to carry the dishes without being in pain. I didn't last long. They fired me. <laughs> um, but, but it's like I was working at a busboy in Jersey City uh, someplace. But that that's not really. I think actually there's working on my brief, brief stint at Swiss Bank. I freaking hated it. Um, I am and, and not that there's anything wrong with it. Certain people love that. Put on a suit and tie, nine to five, thousand rules, employee handbook, yada, yada, yada. Uh I, I loathed it. I loathed it. Um, 
you know, you know, a lot of poker players, like they, they crave freedom. These people are free. Imagine sticking them in a nine to five, like insurance salesman where they have check in or click out. That, that would be me. Right. There's an interesting choice there. I'll get very instructive and, and insightful. Uh, we got time for one last question here. Again, thank you very much, Acid Burn FX. Uh, okay. This, yeah, this brings uh, you know a couple of things together. We talked about films. Um, wants to know if your life was a film, Bill, what would its title be, and how would you like the story to end? Oh my gosh, my life was a film. What would it be? <laughs> very creative question. It'd be the Big Lebowski. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Rug really ties the room together. <laughs> but yeah, it'd be called New Shit Comes the Light, the Big Lebowski sequel. Um, <laughs> what, this is hard. I can go on for hours with this one. Uh, what my like uh, discovery? Um, I think I guess the title. Of the, I can pick the title, right? Yeah, absolutely. It'd be called Discovery. Um, okay. I, I guess it would go through my 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 philosophy that life is about discovery. You you don't know what you want. You don't know what you like. You discover what you like. Right. So you have to get out and explore. Um, and I, I think, you know, it would be a story of a human a guy, girl uh, uh, going through life and discovering many different facets about themselves throughout their journey. Never know that's, what's next. But it but it would be it would definitely be a comedy. <laughs> <laughs> It would definitely be a comedy, an, an, an absurd yeah. comedy. You know what I mean? Like, you know, I'd say G I like it. my life is a happy absurdity. You know, I like so I like, and I like also. You seem to have, um, I think I don't know how you pronounce it in French. Is we divert something like that? Like the the the, 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 the something, something like that. Yeah, it was yeah. Like yeah. This, this uh, zest for life. I think that's, that's yeah. pretty apparent. I've, I've, I've certainly enjoyed it. Um, guys, thank you very much for sending in your questions to Bill Perkins. Again, that friendly reminder to our Cards Jack community. We'd love to see you submit your questions for our future podcast guests in the dedicated thread on the forums. Please be sure to give us a good review on iTunes and spread the word via your social media channels if you like the show. Bill, before we let you go, anything else you'd like to share with our audience? No, it's been great. I mean, we got it in. If you need me back for any follow-up questions, <laughs> just give me a ring. Okay. That's very, that's very kind of you. Thanks again, Bill. Thank you all for tuning again. Uh, tuning in once again to another episode of Cards Chat. I'm Robbie Straczynski. You can follow me on Twitter at Card Player Life. I wish you all a wonderful day. <laughs>